Luke chapter 12. We're going to be looking uh, at another parable of Jesus. This is, uh, we're, we, got, we got this parable and then another parable next week, and then we're done with parables. Can you guys believe it? I mean, we've been in parables for uh, all summer, and uh, I think this is parable 15. Parable 15 that we have been, uh, been in. So, we've got a lot of uh, Jesus' teachings this summer. Uh, hopefully you guys have enjoyed it as much as I have, and uh, the the guests who have come in and taught and, and all that kind of stuff has been really great. Dalton has done a great job as well, uh, helping out. But uh, Luke chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 13, so uh, here it is. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man... Who appointed me judge or an arbiter between you? And then he said to them, Watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told him this parable. And he told them this parable. The crowd of a certain or the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no space to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store up my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you, then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. This is how it will be with those who store up them thi- or store up things for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Then Jesus told his disciples, "Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body and what you will wear. For your life is more than food, and your body is more than clothes. Consider the ravens; they do not sow nor reap." They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothed the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink and do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek His kingdom, and all things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that you that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not fail. Where there is no thief to come near and no moth to destroy. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Um, As we get started, um, when I was, I'll tell you a story about when I was 12 or 13 years old. Uh, I was 12 or 13 years old and I was spending the night with a good friend of mine named Zach Beach. Uh, me and Zach, we played baseball together, and uh, it happened to be a Saturday night. I spent the night with him, and we went to his church that Sunday. Uh, so it was a church I wasn't used to, and uh, we didn't go to like the kids' stuff. We, uh, we stayed in the service. And I don't remember everything about the message from that day, but one of the things I still distinctly remember is that that message was on this passage about worry and anxiety. And I remember the pastor saying things and asking questions like, did you know that worry is a sin? And he said things like, Jesus commands us not to worry. So if we worry, it goes against a direct command of Scripture and therefore is sin. That was his justification for it. Older now and also a pastor now, I have studied this passage in a lot of different places, mainly Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. 
Um, and, and, and here it is again. Uh, but it's not a standalone thing. It's not like this worry and this anxiety uh, passage is, is just by itself and something that Jesus is trying to, to, to just say or teach um, in and of itself, although it's a great teaching in and of itself. It's actually tied to this parable that he tells. And, and um, it, would, it would not have been uncommon for Jesus to do this, right? It, it's not uncommon for Jesus, like a lot of traveling preachers today, to kind of recycle material. Do you know what I mean? So like Jesus, he moved from city to city and place to place, and he taught people. And a lot of the time when he would teach, he would reuse material that he had used previously in other places. And Jesus is doing that here, although he ties it to the context of this parable that he um, is speaking about. And in this case, this famous teaching about anxiety and worry is tied to this idea of a young man who really wants a part of his family business. He wants Jesus to get involved in his family business. He wants Jesus to, to come and speak to his brother and tell him, hey, you need to give my, part of the inheritance. You need to tell my brother to give part of the inheritance to me and, um, and, 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 and not just keep it all for himself. And Luke doesn't tell us that he knows, that Jesus knows this young man's heart, right? He doesn't like explicitly go, and Jesus knowing what was in his heart said this, right? He doesn't say that, but, but obviously Jesus knew what was in his heart, right? Because Jesus then goes on to kind of give us this parable. And it would seem as if Jesus knows what's in our hearts. And this is, uh, this is kind of an interesting request that this young man makes of Jesus, because what he's, he's really doing is he's ultimately saying, and he's asking Jesus, uh, who apparently has a position of prominence in his brother's life, right? It's almost as if um, he's trying to use Jesus' divinity or other people, or specifically his brother's faith, um, as a means to get what he wants. See, this young man believes that if Jesus tells his brother to do something, his brother will do it. And that in and of itself speaks of some faithfulness that maybe this young man's brother has. But as often is the case, Jesus isn't really concerned with uh, the, the things that we are often concerned with. Not saying that he doesn't care about the things that you care about or that he isn't concerned with your life or anything else like that. It's just a lot of times he's, he's not concerned in the same manner. That we are concerned. They, they are not of utmost importance to him. He looks at things differently and he thinks differently and caring about the kingdom and his mission um, are pretty much at the top of his priority list. And ultimately, he's asking Jesus to, to handle something that is far less about his glory and his kingdom. Do we ever do that? Do we ever ask Jesus to do something for us that really has nothing to do with him getting any of the credit but just making our life better? Do we ever use our relationship with God in that way to try and get us what we really, really want? And Jesus has a word for this. It's greed. Now, long story short, Jesus is in the presence of this young man, and instead of this young man being in awe and in wonder of who Jesus is, not really concerned about that. Jesus really isn't enough for him. Uh, Jesus, he wants, he wants Jesus to do something for him. Maybe this young man is even saying, like, I'll follow this teacher. I'll even follow Jesus if he'll do this for me. But either way, Jesus isn't enough in and of himself for this young man. And this young man wants more. And in this case, he wants more money. He wants more possessions. He wants more of his family inheritance. And this young man won't be happy if all he has is Christ. It's very important if we should ask ourselves this question. Are we okay with Christ? If he is all we have, are we good with that? If he's all we have, are we okay with that? Because if not, we might fall into this trap as well. Jesus knows that this is what this young man wants, and so he tells this parable. And he starts this parable in a very interesting way. He says, there was once a rich man. Now, the fact that he was already rich is really important, okay? Uh, this past week, I lost my iPhone. 
All right. Uh, I know it's 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 pretty pretty hard, but I'll say after four days with no iPhone, I felt a lot better than with four days with my iPhone. So uh, so I don't know. Maybe there's something to that. Maybe it's just you know slowly killing. Uh, anyway, um, I. I lost my iPhone. I couldn't find it anywhere. I was like, I, I, I went to I look for it Monday morning really quickly before heading into the office. Couldn't find it. Showed up at the office. Got up on my iPad. Find my iPhone. It said it was here at the building. I was like, it's not here at the building. I know it's not here at the building. That's a lie. All right? This find my iPhone thing is lying to me. Um, and, uh, and so I was like, I had it at home. And the last time I was at the church building was like, 4 p.m. yesterday, and so I've been home with my phone. I know I have my phone at home. I haven't been back to the church. Yet. There's no way my phone is here, right? Uh, but I'm like, well, all right, maybe it's in my car. So I go out into my car, and I look at my car, not my car anywhere. Can't find my phone anywhere. All right, so then I turn my house upside down, and I'm like, I'm literally, it's like the woman with the lost coin. I'm flipping everything. <laughs> I'm, I flip couches over, I pull up cu- couch cushions, I do everything trying to find my phone. And I finally determined, I, I, I had a very serious conversation with my five-year-old. I was, I, was, I was like, I was so determined, one of my children took my phone and hit it. Because right? that's what they do. You guys know. Those of you that have kids know. This is what your kids do. They just they come and take your stuff, and then they go hide it. <laughs> I had $200 sitting in my, my drawer, like, Three weeks ago, two hundred dollars cash sitting in my drawer. Two, three weeks ago, uh, before we went on vacation, and my son Judah came in and took it, put it underneath his bed. <laughs> I'm telling you. So I thought, okay, Judah, Judah, you know, he's, you know, and, I, and so we're like, we're like, I'm like, I'm like there with Judah one night, put him to bed. I'm like, Buddy, did you take my phone? And he's like, no. <laughs> and he's like, buddy. I'm like, buddy, come on, like, it's not funny anymore. Like, I'll give you a hundred dollars. Just give me my phone back. <laughs> he's like, he's like, Daddy, I didn't, I didn't take my phone. Right? I offered all of my kids a hundred dollars to ever find it. <laughs> none of them, none of them could find it. Um, thir- Thursday, I'm coming back from lunch. Okay, I took my kids to lunch and I took Dalton to lunch with me. And we're so we're minivan because that's the only car that will fit that number of people because I have so many children. Uh, <laughs> and I pull up next to my car, my phone is sitting on the hood of my car. It has been there for four days. It has been through rainstorms. <laughs> it has been 75 miles an hour on US-1. I mean, it has done it all. It is. It, it has had an experience. And I, I, went, I went upstairs, put it on a charger, it worked great. All right, so... Um, that's why I buy Apple products. Okay, so um, anyway, so so here we go. So, long story short, in the process of turning my house over, like the woman who lost her coin, um, I found I found an iPhone, I found two iPads and three Apple Watches that were just in my house, dead, sitting in a drawer or in a basket or something. I am very rich, and most of us are very rich. Most of us are in a really, really, really good place when we can have very expensive things just off to the wayside for the newer and nicer and more shiny, right? Most of us are rich, and that's why him saying that he was speaking about a rich man should matter to us. That this idea of being rich is important to us. Because he was rich already. That's the point. You and I, we are rich already. Most of us. And so, it's important that we we listen. It's important that we listen. Jesus continues to say this rich man had a great harvest. And the harvest was so big that his barns would not hold it. And so what do you do when you can't hold all the stuff? You tear down the barns and build bigger ones. Or at least that's what this guy thought to himself. And so he decides to do that because it, he'll make far more. He'll have far more. And he'll be able to gain far more if he can just 
get bigger barns to hold all of those things. But he doesn't need more stuff, does he? Because he's already rich. And there's an important uh, play on words here that Jesus uses in this passage. The word uh, translated himself or myself, uh, it makes sense as you read the story in English where it says the man said to himself or he said, he said you know, I know what I will do or, or hold to this pursuit. But it's his soul that's going to be demanded of him. And he'll have nothing to show for it except bigger barns. Jesus, Jesus says in another teaching, he says, what good is it to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit your soul? And that's what this guy in this parable does. He has a lot. He chases after a lot. And yet he loses his soul in the process. And Jesus ties this parable to this idea of anxiety and worry. It's really interesting. He then encourages his disciples and those listening. He says, he says, Look, guys, I'll take care of you. You don't have to live this way. You don't have to be worried and anxious about the, the stuff. I'll take care of the stuff. You're not more valuable than all of these other things. Which brings me back to where I started this talk, right? I, I heard a pastor once say that worry is a sin, and I don't know if that's true. Um, I don't know that any of us can go a day without just worrying about something, right? So I don't know if, if worry is ultimately a sin. I, Jesus says that each day has enough trouble of its own. I mean, so it, there, there's going to be some worry at times, some fear, some anxiety at times. Um, but what I do think, I can say, is that if we are worried about the basic things that Jesus has promised and will always take care of for us, it will likely take us to a place where we become captive to an incessant need for more. Where Jesus is no longer enough. And where we... Um, where we've given into this life and this lie that leads us to greed, to be greedy, that he can't, isn't big enough or good enough to provide for us. So worry in and of itself, I don't know if that's actually a sin, although I don't think it really helps a whole lot. Jesus does say that. He says, which of you by worrying can add an hour to your life? So, I mean, it, 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 worrying is not helping anybody. Um, but worry, especially when it comes to a life that you know, we are building here on earth, we're worried about the thing and how our life is going to play out and, and what tomorrow is going to bring and all of those other kinds of things. When we are worried about that, when we are anxious about that, it can lead to very, very sinful things like greed which is talked about as a sin all throughout the New Testament. And Jesus says, be on guard against it. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5 that greed is one of the things that is like, it's a fruit of the flesh, not a fruit of the spirit. Right next to malice and anger and slander, and sexual immorality. So greed is something that is sin. And being greedy is Sinful. Greed is about what our hearts long for most. What the deepest part of who we are longs for most. And for many people, that's not Jesus. And so we have to be careful. Jesus said you have to beware of all kinds of greed. How can you tell if you're greedy? Well, I think in order to understand or know if you're greedy, you have to define greed. Uh, often we only associate greed with money and possessions, and it absolutely has a lot to do with money and possessions, probably more so than anything else, but it's probably not just money and possessions, probably other things as well. Uh, and, um, and, and it's best defined, I think, by an intense, uh, an intense and selfish desire for something. 
an intense and selfish desire for something. So how can you tell if you're greedy? Well, do you have an intense and selfish desire for something? Do you have an intense and selfish desire for more money? That you're willing to do whatever it takes to take hold of that? You'll do whatever it takes to climb the corporate ladder? You'll take the job that has you traveling and spending more and more and more and more time away from your family, which is more important in the eyes of God, just to make more money? Now, that might be the only job you can get. I don't know. So if it is, you got to have a job. But maybe it's not. Do you have an intense and selfish desire for a new home? Not just any home, but like one that's bigger. It's got more space. I went and looked at one a couple of weeks ago. Is that a pool? I got kids and a wife from Florida. We need a pool. <laughs> Maybe we don't need one. Maybe we just want one. What are we willing to do to get one? Do you have an intense and selfish desire for a certain kind of car or a certain kind of lifestyle, certain kinds of clothes, certain kinds of body types, certain kinds of degrees, particular job or, or particular comfort? Now look, I, I, none of those things are bad things. Money is not evil. It's the love of money that's evil. That's what Jesus said. Having a nice home or a new home is not evil. New cars, not evil. New clothes, not evil. None of that stuff is bad, right? But if they, if they are our heart's deepest desire and the pursuit of our life, and we want those things more than we want to be with Jesus, more than we want to become like Jesus, more than we want to do what Jesus does, we have a problem, and it's called greed. The reality is that we want these things more than we want Jesus himself. If Jesus just isn't enough for us, we have a problem with greed. The best way to guard our hearts against greed, I think, is to ask ourselves, like, is the desire that I have, is it focused on primarily my family, my church, God's kingdom, having the ability to serve others, share the gospel, or just share stuff with people who are in need because I am rich and because I am wealthy and because I have that ability, and that opportunity. It's a great way to guard yourself against uh, things that uh, that lead us into acting on our greed, because I think we're all somewhat greedy, right? I think we all kind of deal with this and struggle with this in a way that, like, we can easily justify what we want. And then there's also times where we just need to, like, take a step back and go, well, but is this a selfish desire? Is this desire rooted in self? Is it so intense that I can't get it to be quiet? Well, how do I how do I get how do I change that? Well, I put my focus not on myself but on everyone else. I put my focus on my family and my church and God's kingdom. I put my focus on others, not myself, which is maybe the most Christ-like thing we can do, right? Now, I think it's also important that we separate the idea of greed from the, the need of things. Because there are things that we need, right? Like, that's just absolutely true. We, we need a job. We need to make money to be able to pay bills and, like, live and do all this stuff, put food on the table. We need all of that stuff. Uh, we need clothes. We need all of that. And when you uh, need something from time to time, from time to time when you actually have a need, uh, that like needs to be met, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with going out and getting the thing that you want most, if you can afford it, when you have to fulfill that need. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? So I don't think that's greedy, okay? I think that's fulfilling a need, and there's nothing wrong with buying something that you want when you're fulfilling a need, right? But oftentimes we buy things we don't need. 
And we go after things that we don't need. And we desire things that we don't need. And we make our life's goal and pursuit going after things that we don't need. And when you really don't have a need, when you don't need more money to pay the bills, when you don't need another car, when you don't need more clothes, when you don't need anything, and yet you're still worried, and you're still wondering, and you still have this incessant desire for more, rooted in building up yourself and your life here on earth, you can know that you are greedy. And greed is powerful. It's strong. And it will only bring about more worry and more anxiety in our life. So watch out, Jesus says. Watch out. Be careful. And guard yourself against all kinds of greed. I know I need to hear that. You know? I know I need to, to hear that every day. I want so many things that I don't have. I have a desire for so many things that I think will make me happier. And I've actually gone after some of them. And some of them are cool, they're fun. I don't know if they actually change my life like I expect them to. And so I think we have to be careful. We have to be on guard. Because we're always, always being given the option for more. You know, the average American sees around 4,000 ads a day. And what do those ads sell? more stuff you don't have i know for me the thing i get the most ads for whenever i open up my phone is uh our car ads because i look at cars all the time <laughs> not too long ago i even went and test drove one the one i wanted they didn't have so i showed up in the lot and it was like no they don't have that car anymore they've sold it dog on it Oh, but there's another one. Let me try that one out. My daughter loved it. She thought it was great. She was like, Daddy, can we take it home? <laughs> so I, I get it, guys. That's a struggle I have every single day. Jesus is talking to us. We're already rich. We already have everything we need. Do you have everything you need to get through today? It's enough. Let tomorrow worry about itself. If we can keep that perspective, did I wake up today? Did I have food put on? Yep. Do I have enough to put food on the table today? Yep. We keep that perspective of gratitude that today is a day where we have everything we need. That God's been faithful to us today. And we can protect ourselves and guard against greed. Here's the coolest thing. As I study this. The coolest thing is that the most beautiful thing, one of the most beautiful things that we find in the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is that Jesus didn't have an intense or selfish desire for anything. That's who Jesus was. His whole mission was you and me. He was totally focused on the other. And although he could have had everything, he could have, he's the only one who could have literally taken hold of every selfish desire that he ever might have had. He chose a different way. He chose to be selfless. He always 
gave of himself, even to the point of death on the cross. And he could have taken everything for himself. He could have had everything that he ever wanted, everything that he ever desired, but his desire and the joy set before him was not everything. It was you. Each week, as we come to the table, as we take communion, take communion remembering that God, like, like that we serve a God and a king who could have had everything and yet gave everything up for us. That he died for sinners like you and me. This is the gospel. That our greed didn't keep Jesus from coming near to us. That our addiction didn't keep Jesus from coming near to us. That our failures didn't keep Jesus from coming near to us. But it brought him closer and he said, I love you. I'm going to give everything for you. This is the good news of Jesus. He was not full of greed, but instead he was full of kindness and forgiveness and compassion. As we come to the table this week, I just want to pray that you remember that, that you cling to that, that you make your heart's desire to be like Christ in that way, to be like him and let him be enough. Let him be enough. Take him at his word that he'll take care of you. Let his love and his service be the pursuit of your life, that you might love like him and serve others like him. Because I'll tell you this, if Jesus can, if Jesus can conquer death, he can conquer whatever you're worried about right now. Whatever thing you're anxious about or worried about or thinking, like, oh, i got to go after that because if I don't, I'm going to miss it. I'm going to lose it. He can take care of that. If Jesus can conquer death, it, he's bigger and better than anything that your heart could ever want or desire. Everything that you're chasing after, whatever you're trying to fill your life with, you'll find in Christ. He is the desire of your heart. If you chase after him, you'll find it. And you'll find contentment and joy. In every circumstance. This is why Paul can say things like, I've learned what it means to have plenty, and I've learned what it means to be in want. But I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He finds his strength in Christ. He finds his hope in Christ. He finds his life and the desires, the deepest desires of his heart fulfilled in Christ. And we can too. And this table can remind us of that. Remind us that he is good enough, powerful enough, and better than anything we could want or desire. So as we come to the table this morning, I pray that we'll remember that. We'll take hope in that. And we'll worship him knowing and believing that. Let's pray. God, I, um, I thank you that we, we see in your word that you confront difficult things that maybe we don't like. And um, we don't like being called out on or having to deal with. But God, I pray that right now we will come to know and come to realize and come to understand that first and foremost, we are rich because you have blessed us greatly. Monetarily and financially, we have so much more than most people in our world. We take it for granted, and God, for that we apologize. We repent. We 
ask for your kindness and your forgiveness. God, we also recognize that all our desires are found in you. Everything we want is found in you. And if we could just learn and know what it means to be with you, to have the chance to, to walk with you each day, God, we would, we would find that those, those things that we, we hold so dear, they, they grow strangely dim as we walk with you. And you become all we want. You become all we desire. God, I pray that you convict us and move us to be people who, who give to the poor. I pray that, that we see the abundance of possessions that we have. And, and God, I pray that you'll, you'll inspire us to sell some of those things. Not for our own benefit so we can get bigger and better things, but we'll sell some things to just bless other people. To give away. To offer love, service. For some of us, that feels like a sacrifice, but it's not really a sacrifice. For some of us, it feels like we're having to give away a lot, but God, we're not giving away anything that really matters. So God, help us to, to be reminded of what you've given up for us, how you came and how you served, how you love the poor and the needy. God, how you provide for us in times of need. God, may you give us hearts that think about and pray through the decisions that we make, how we spend our money, the things that we do. God, I also pray that you remind us of your grace. Remind us of your love. Remind us that your broken body and your shed blood proof that you are enough, that you are always enough, that you are more than enough. We love you. We praise you because you are good to us sinners. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may stand and move, uh, take communion whenever you feel led.